thank you so much for um, first just the the gracious welcome and introduction, Becky, um, and especially for uh, the honor of being able to to be in this position, both for the Linguist Award to be able to get it um, side by side this year with Forrest Crawford, which is if you know Forrest, this is intimidating. Like, here's me, and, and Forrest gave his address several weeks ago. Um, so I have I have so many um, shoes to fill, so many different, just great examples of what community engaged work, of what teaching looks like and means. Um, and that's with Forrest. That's with um, all of the previous recipients. Um, all the way back to a dear colleague, Catherine McKay. <clears throat> so it's um, it's kind of intimidating to have to give, to get to give this talk, but I've been looking forward to it for a year. I pictured it being in a space where we would all be, uh, but from the corner room in my home with a screen, this, this will do and it has its own charm. I wanted to kind of, present this as, uh, I think as I truly am, um, this is kind of an accident, how I've gotten into community engaged learning. And I also want to kind of not just apologize for that, not apologize for that, but suggest that this is how we should be doing our work, not just in community engagement, but also in education in general. Uh, and so I suggest it's for introverts, skeptics, and curmudgeons, because I have come from that place as an introvert turning into a skeptic. And now I am officially just an old curmudgeon um, I was introduced a few weeks ago as our most senior science education specialist in the College of Science, and I realized, oh, I'm now that guy. So from a curmudgeon, I want to kind of give you a sense of what my vision for um, learning in general and community-based learning um, could look like through some of the examples that I haven't created. I've learned from them as they've kind of created in front of me or, or kind of just uh, became in front of me. So let me start with just kind of a little bit about my story. And I think very few people actually understand, well, no one understands who I am, like this is common, right? Uh, but I, I, I really think that few people know that I don't actually belong in a physics department, even though that's where I've been hired. And in most places, um, most campuses across the country, across, around the world, I would not even be considered in the applicant pool. I was raised by physicists as an undergrad and master's student. And then I went into a PhD in education, took teacher education courses, and then a physics department welcomed me back into their arms. And I think that speaks well of the physics department that we have, uh, as well as the College of Science in general, that an education person um, could be housed in such a you know, in a lab-based kind of place, you know, where the, all the PhD physicists happen to be. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because I entered from graduate work in physics into a school of education. The first class I had, I remember we were sitting there in our rows and Julie Guest Newsom, one of my um, mentors in science education, she was teaching the class and she said, all right, I'd like everyone to tell us why you're here why do you want to be a teacher? And I was so excited to present my story because my story was, I love physics. I love science. I love being able to understand it in such a way that I can then help other people understand it. And as I was waiting for my turn to speak, you know, this is what we do is, is you know, wait for our turn to speak while we're half listening to other people. I noticed that the other people were saying things like, I just love second graders. I just love kids. I just love getting to know people. And I thought that is so wrongheaded. That is ridiculous. What is wrong with all of these people who love other people? And I didn't understand <laughs> that <laughs> maybe I was in the wrong place. Uh, fortunately, it worked out okay. Um, but I didn't understand that that was part of the gig. And I've slowly kind of come from that place, it's taken me 20, 25 years, to go from I love physics and I want other people to understand it, to I have this connection with people. I'll get to why I think that's important um, as we continue. But I've had to progress through there. Uh, this is the image here is 
me coming off of Forrester Pass in the high Uintas, I thought following Forrest Crawford and Forrester Pass should go hand in hand. Um, and also I think the journey has been long and arduous. I like what this provides. Um, at the same time, my connection with community engagement is not one where I said, I want to go out and work with the community and help the citizenry shape their society. I, and still to this day, my sense of community engagement is, damn it, look, there's a grocery cart in the middle of the parking lot. I hate people. And this is exactly the kind of thing that people do. And this is why I don't want to interact with people. Go back to my first day in teacher education. Uh, and and I, I make a point of finding that cart and putting it back into the, the rack where it's supposed to go. And then I stomp back to my car and say, what's wrong with people? And Karen tells me, well, it could have been some woman who is 11 months pregnant and she couldn't. And I just don't care. Like, I think this is selfish and I think people should put their carts back. And for me, that epitomized what I should do to help society. I think I've grown. I think I've changed that I can put grocery carts back, but there may be more to it. There may be a bigger purpose to things, but still this is where I started. I should also say that kind of my orientation and let me say, interject before I forget, that um, Brenda and, and Ravi actually, and Becky and so many of the rest of you, I am going to say <laughs> that I don't like the term community engaged learning. I don't like the terms high impact education and um, educational experiences. And it's not because I don't believe in those things it's because I think sometimes the terms get out in front of us before we have the chance to think about what that means. And when I think back, I, I use this slide, this picture of the overhead projector, oops, over and over and over again. Pardon me. There we go. Um, and I use it over and over and over again because in the 19, actually around 1957, when, when the Russians, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, all the science education community said, let's fix things for the United States and let's get our science education off the ground. And we came up with the overhead projector. That was our great, literally, this was our great educational innovation. And I point this out, this pic particular picture shows how you can do a reveal of stuff that was hidden before on the overhead projector. Uh, and we thought this will solve everything. And of course it didn't. And of course the iPads didn't. And of course the smart boards didn't. And of course Zoom didn't. All of our big innovations, whether they're pieces of technology or they're big strategic initiatives or they're acronyms or whatever, they do not solve all of our educational issues. We've got so many other things going on and it goes beyond the tools that we have. So um, I would even go so far as to say, I think some of those tools, just having them could be harmful because we put our faith in them. And as an accidental community engaged educator, um, I wanna see what it is that we're actually going for. I wanna kind of imagine for myself, how did I get there? And how is it that, um, that we kind of characterize uh, learning? And what is it that we're actually aiming for? Um, I could also go on a big rant about STEM and STEAM. I, I think those terms are overused and, and basically malpractice as well. But that's another lecture, probably just me in the dark corner of my own office. OK. Oh, that's funny. I pushed it accidentally once and now, there we go. So I wanted to kind of um, emphasize this with photos we took actually about a year ago to the day um, or around that time when pandemic was in full swing and one kid um, is, is kind of on lockdown from high school. Another kid comes home from college. Karen is teaching this, that picture, her top middle 
of her knitting with a camera strapped to her with with a microphone and, and she's doing knitting instructing over zoom with the iphone with like all of these things we look at that and say look at the amazing technology the amazing effort that went into all of this and i'm willing to bet that you look at that and say oh how sad remember that time when we had to teach over zoom oh right remember that time when anna took her a dance or aerobics class over Zoom in her backyard remotely with everyone else from hundreds of miles away. Remember when, well, actually, Grace wasn't too disappointed that she had a cat on her shoulder while she was doing school. But other than that, remember that time when that was, that was so painful. I was taking pictures of different things that I could send to pictures to, to send to teachers to say, here are some investigations you could look at for your students in your classroom. Um, and I love that picture of the droplets on the on the lupin, but even that I had to send it technologically, I had to rely on this disconnection. And I think the fact that seeing these images might kind of break our hearts leads me to think about what is it that we're trying to do in education. If I were an instructional designer and I were writing the book of instructional design, it would be a very short book um, the first chapter or page or line would be, if you want students to learn a thing, make them do that thing. So that's probably uncontroversial, um, but I think we often, maybe we seldom do it. We say we want learners to be critical thinkers. Do we make them do critical thinking? We say we want them to be engaged in the community. Do we make them do those things. We say we want them to be reflective. We say we want them to create. We say that we want them to do all these kind of high level synthesizing kinds of things. But I imagine, and I'm speaking personally for myself, we probably don't do that as much as would be required for them to actually learn critical thinking, reflection, um, engagement, etc. So certainly community engaged learning gives us an inroad to that, but there's more than just like that explicit nature. There's also, I think, some point at which we have to say, what is it that I, the teacher, love to do? What is it that makes me happy? What is it that brings me joy? I don't see this in instructional design so much. But I think we should acknowledge that you as a teacher, me as a teacher is a very different person than Stacy Palin as a teacher. And if you know Stacy Palin, you know she is a phenomenal teacher. She's extraordinary and I will never be her, but I will be me. And being me will be a different version of good from her. And I think we need to embrace the who we are as a person within that teaching context. That leads that if you're going to be yourself, you should also not be afraid to try things out, to be whimsical, creative, etc. To do something not because it was told to you in a lesson plan or in some kind of design or in some kind of curriculum, but because it felt right. Now, maybe this isn't always the case. Maybe we shouldn't do all the things we think. Certainly, we shouldn't say all the things that we think, but there's certainly plenty of room to try something that no one else has done, that hasn't been tested. Because what's the worst that could happen? Well, it would be your experiments. It's a test of how does that go? And probably it will go, something will happen. And probably you'll learn something out of that. And probably um, you'll continue to work through that. But maybe most important of all, and I think we see this right here and now, is that, and this, this is something that Forrest told us that he was emphasizing in the Linquist lecture of a few weeks ago, that the things that we're doing in our classrooms, that all of those teachers I took my first education course with knew that I did not, was that teaching is about relationships. It is not about the information I have to give you. Oh well, yeah, sure, there's some of that. And it's not about the thing that you're going to learn how to do. Like, the thing that gives us meaning in a classroom or in any kind of educational context is how is it that we connect with each other? And in especially here and now, if we've learned nothing else, it's that we need that. I think we're all kind of 
reeling from some kind of collective broken heart. And I think we're going to, I hope we're going to reflect on this moment and say, yeah, these relationships that we've kind of severed, that we've kind of found these chasms, these are the things that we really value about education. We see that now. And these are the kinds of things that I think I've learned through some of my own work, accidental as it may have been. And so when I think about the work that I've gotten to do, been privileged to do, have been given permission from God knows where to be able to do, um, I think this particular example I'd like to show you is, is kind of what um, like exemplifies, or at least it gives me a poster. Um, and I've used this image in multiple presentations. I will not stop using this image because it, it cracks me up every time for so many reasons. First of all, um, here's a bunch of idiots with, with cl dark glasses on that doesn't allow any light to come through except when you're staring directly at the sun. This is during the partial eclipse portion of what would become the total eclipse. We're at around 11,000 feet on a place known as Lester Pass in the Wind Rivers. Um, these people here, I'm on the far right, on the far left is my uncle-in-law, Uncle Mark, and a dear friend, John Setledge, who, yes, he is wearing dark glasses. We are all wearing dark glasses. We cannot see each other, but he's pointing. He is, he is the editor of the most highly regarded science education journal in the world. And he is pointing at the sun when no one can see what he's doing. I love that fact. And then there's the rest of my family. People I love most in this world are in this photo. And we're staring at the sun and we're in a place like no other. And in a few moments, we get to look at this. And I get, you know, kind of like my voice starts to crack when I think of this, when I start to talk about it, because this is probably, and there's probably others, but it's among my top most influential learning moment ever. And it's not just because of the solar eclipse and like, oh, he's geeking out about the physics of the solar eclipse, cute little physicist. It's because of the moment and of the sun and of the dark and of the uniqueness and where we were and who we are and who we were with. All of those things together. So this becomes then my goal for all of my educational endeavors. I will never I don't think reach this particular moment. Like, how could I rise? If you saw the solar eclipse, you know what I'm talking. If you didn't, you don't know what I'm talking about. And that's fine. But this is what I would aspire to, this kind of moment of personal connection, of, of group connection, of a moment, of a place all wrapped into one. This is where I learn the deepest, most important, uh, most influential things in the in the most significant ways. So all I have to do is emulate this in all of my other learning contexts. So um, these are some of the. It, it wasn't an explicit attempt. These are accidental attempts that I've I've used to try to get to those to emulate that kind of an engagement. Um, and as Becky Joe is suggesting, I think for me, this started with Science in the Park. And this was completely accidental simply because um, there's a long story here. Stacy Palin, who was directing the, the Op Planetarium at the time, had a large grant. Some of it required um, some public outreach. She said, Adam, what can you do about this? I said, oh, we'll do something. And then my family points out to me, like, look at all the children out there in the parks. Every summer, every weekday, um, they're getting lunch there. And I said to myself, that's exactly where we should be doing science because that's where the kids are. That's where they're playing. Scientists play out in their natural habitat. And that's exactly the essence of science that I want all people to have. Um, and this image of this little boy uh, brings that home to me that um, just moments before this picture was taken, he was like climbing up on the tables and he was like grabbing stuff. 
And I happened to be walking around and said, hey, look at this. I handed him a little lens and then I lied down belly to the ground in the grass. And then he did the same thing. And we explored the jungle of the microscopic world in the grass and there's bugs and there's dirt and there's scaly things and there's leafy things. And that's, he was my mentor scientist right there in that moment. And for me to see a kid doing that is to see a kid engaging with their world, engaging with their ideas, engaging with science exactly the way I want them to. And we don't get a chance to do this in schools and that's fine. We'll do this outside in the park where you just got your little hot dog and some chocolate milk. Here's what we get to do next is crawl around on the ground. Or uh, we see kids all, I love the fact that they're all with their hands in the goo all together, side by side by side by side by side. Or looking at things, literally looking through a lens at one another, looking through a giant bubble that you have in your own hands at one another. Uh, and to me, this is the inspiring feature of Science in the Parks is it's this group of kids who just kind of like engulf our collection of tents and tables and stuff. And each day of the week, they get to do a different thing or collection of things. And they get to do it with us, with one another right there in their own neighborhood. And they get like this, this fierce concentration on the spinny thing or the moving thing or the launch thing or the gooey thing or the slippery thing or the whatever it happens to be. Um, and that's, that's the essence of being a scientist is be able to like grasp these things in that very physical community, hand in hand kind of way. Um, the other thing, and I think it would be easy to forget this, but maybe the most important thing to me is not the hundreds of kids we get each day at this. Um, I mean, I can't say it's not about them. Of course it's about, well, no, first of all, it's about me and what brings me joy. And also it's about the kids, but also the volunteers who are working in the parks. They get to see, usually as pre-service science teachers, pre-service elementary teachers, um, they get to see science as it could be. And maybe as they hadn't experienced it for themselves and they get to see how this works out. Um, as kids are reflecting those kinds of actions directly to them. The, the college students and the six-year-olds get to do the same science right there, and we get to model what it could look like in a future third grade classroom, at least I hope. Um, so the, the other benefit that I should point out is that um, we got to a point where things like science in the parks, and there's a long history of community engagement and outreach and connections with the greater public through the College of Science. Um, and I was able to say, hey, you know, we could keep doing this um, even after I die. And, and Dean Andrea said, really, after you die? And she said, yes, wouldn't that be great? She said, we should make sure that this goes on for the long term. And so she created um, the, a community engaged learning position for our college. Um, Amanda Gentry got hired as our first person for that gig. This is how you'd normally, in case, I'd show you a normal picture of, of Amanda, um, but you might not recognize her. If you see a Tyrannosaurus Rex, Rex wandering through campus, you know that's Amanda. Um, but she, we now have like this whole mission around community engagement that's centered on Amanda and her office. And of course, lots of other things like physics open house and op planetarium is going, has been going on for decades and uh, discovery loop and all, you know, all kinds of things going on. This gets to continue because of the value we place as an institution in this work. And I'm super, I'm immensely grateful that I can do other things and continue to see all of these things happening that we can all collectively continue to do this work together. So. I'm so grateful that Amanda is here. The other accidental example I like to point out because it's so ridiculous. If you've ever, if I were had enough room, I would stand up and show you how inadequately I can touch my toes. Um, it's ridiculous to think of me working with dancers, like absolutely absurd. And yet I found myself, there's a longer story, but I found myself in a dance class with Eric Stern. 
I found myself saying, oh yeah, I can help with this. And then I found one thing led to another. And then we went into this greater project uh, with body in motion forces at play, working with the dancers. You can see in this particular image, um, dancers perfectly postured, perfectly posed as dancers should be and swinging pendulums exactly as scientists should do. And all of that is taking place at the same time. And you might say, and this is semi-accurate to say, oh, so it's about how art and science or how physics and dance go together. Yeah, kind of, but it's also how do we make meaning? How do we create, how do we make sense of our world? How is it that we are human? How do we express that? I think that's what this project was about. Um, and the work endures working with teachers. Um, but you see like, well, first of all, I just like to show that larger image because you see some glowing um, small things underneath the wave and this electrical cord. Uh, those are my, my bare feet. I'm lying here on the dance floor, which is my the perfect position for me. It was well choreographed. Um, but I also got to see other things besides on stage. I got to see the rehearsal, how people work together. I got to see the, the actual skills and practices of individual dancers. Um, Asia and Jordan here, like I, I look at this regularly, that image of him holding her up, but not really holding her up because she's doing something too. Like, I don't know how you do that. That's amazing. It gives me all kinds of questions and places to think about both science and art simultaneously. Um, it also gave me a great chance to work with someone like Eric Stern, a choreographer, a dancer, a professional artist that I have, I, there's, there's nothing on my CV that would say, oh, you should work with a dancer. Like, absolutely not. But here we are on stage pulling on each other with, he's mostly pulling on me. If you know Eric, you know, that's probably the way it should go. And I'm kind of suspended there. Um, but this is, we have this great working relationship of, of combining things, throwing out lots of bad ideas and seeing how it is that these could play out in helping others learn about our practices. And we got to see this, not just in professional dancers or student dancers, but in kids. And we got to see that workshop um, in individual classrooms. Here's a physics teacher with his ninth graders, all arm and arm and arm and arm. I lost track of how many arms I said, um, holding each other up, looking at how choreography, that expression and how systems and how structures and how expression all get linked together. This, in this case, both figuratively and literally. So, um, I'm grateful that I get to have the chance to do that kind of work that I don't usually think I would have, who would have imagined? And who would have imagined that we would take this kind of work to work with science teacher educators at the Association for Science Teacher Education that was held one year in Reno in a giant, um, um, what do you call the, the you know, all of the places of, you know, the dark corners and the places of disrepute in, in Reno, all of these uh, nightclubs and such. We got to host a workshop in a nightclub in a Reno resort to show science teachers, teachers of science teachers, how to work with dance and patterns and mathematical relationships and physics all at the same time. One of these individuals uh, one of these college educators is from BYU. And I, every time I see him there, I think, oh, I should report him. That would be so funny. And then I, maybe that wouldn't be funny. Like maybe I should not speak of this on a recorded Zoom conference. But I love the fact that all of these weird pieces come together. And it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't be meaningful if we weren't all there in the same place at the same time. That's how it created some kind of meaning. And that leads me to my third kind of accidental, although this is probably where my career was supposed to go from the start in, uh, in my pursuit of community engagement, um, is my work with teachers. And a lot of the work I've done with teachers is, was done as extensions from Science in the Parks. I took those kinds of things and, and brought them to teachers 
um, or had teachers inform what I'm doing in science in the park. The stuff that we did with dance and science, this is this particular image is uh, me and Eric hosting a bunch of uh, teachers who are interested in these kinds of intersections, working with paper and air and motion and uh, choreography and design and all of the like. Um, all of these pieces, I think, kind of build to my, my work with teachers. Sometimes it looks like this. Um, I brought this to the fore just because, well, sometimes you bring a whole bunch of teachers together and they all do amazing things. This happens to be images from exactly or a little more than a year ago, a Saturday before our spring break here in Tracy Hall um, on campus. We had close to 500 teachers on that Saturday. It was February 29th. I remember because like nothing was like, we, we got a good way to book different things in the union building because no one else had thought to book it because it was leap day and was right before spring break. And so we were able to bring 500 to teachers to campus, but we were all at the moment kind of looking at each other like, is this a good idea? What's going to happen next? We had no idea what really was going to happen next, but this was almost the instant before everything kind of shut down, before we couldn't do these kinds of things anymore. So one aspect of my work with teachers is just saying, hey, let's bring them together to campus. But I think the most meaningful work is me out there doing science with them in the same kinds of ways that I would do science with that kid lying there in the dirt. Um, so there's some teachers here in this middle frame, the big picture. This is down St. George actually, and we were doing a day long workshop and every hour we'd go outside with the mop and we'd see what the shadow of the mop uh, would do, where it was being cast. And we took a record of that to see what kind of patterns we could see. How do we make sense of that? There is that time when I was with a busload of teachers going across the state and we were in Capitol Reef and we happened to come across an old uranium mine in Capitol Reef National Park and we happened to have Geiger counters and we happened to get to experience that all together. Like, this is what a uranium mine does. And this is how, you, and isn't it great that we have these Geiger counters? That's um, Tom Peterson next to me with the other Geiger counter. He teaches here in Ogden. Um, even though apparently that was taken about 40 years ago when my hair was darker. Uh, and then on the upper right hand corner is me at the children's school working with uh, some student teachers there and they invited me down and, and which is basically just an excuse for me to play with goo with kids and see how that works out and see what the teachers take away from that all at the same time. This is all to say that I think this, this is where my career should be. This is where my community engagement has all been heading is that work with teachers, because when I go to, when I want to see what is the best possible educational scenario, what's the best example of teaching I can imagine, I go to a second grade classroom. I can learn so much from that space. And it's flattering for me to think that they're doing a workshop or a class or something with me thinking that they can get something from me because it's this full circle of improving all of our educational efforts. Um, and again, that means it's about context, it's about finding ourselves in those moments and it's about those relationships. And I think my best example that I can think of for how that works really well is thinking about how we make music. How does a band, each of those members of the band individually knowing something about their instrument or their note or their whatever, how do they all come together to put that together to create something new? How do they have that relationship? How, what is it that they are all aspiring to do? And uh, Bill Evans, if you're familiar with the jazz pianist, he wrote the liner notes. I figure it's the pianist's job to write the liner notes on jazz albums. He wrote them on Kind of Blue for Miles Davis. And he talks about this very human social need for sympathy from all members to bend for a common result. And I su suspect he could have been talking about community engaged learning. He could have been talking about high impact educational experiences. How is it that we all work together? How do we build relationships? 
and we're all creating something as individuals, but also collectively at the same time, how does that all morph together? You have to be somehow connected and somehow engaged with one another. So I've tried to put this all together into some kind of educational ideal. Uh, and I've been working on this um, just as a proof of concept. Like if I can ever get the book written, it will be something like this, that when we think about learning, of course, we think about what is it that you know? And we often also think about what is it that you can do? Skills and knowledge. But maybe sometimes we should more consider the person and who they are, who they become, what they develop to be in that learning experience. And maybe most of all, especially for this audience, we should think especially about how is it that you work together with the greater group? How is it that you build those relationships? How is it those, that those relationships actually become something more than individual people talking at each other? I think thinking of jazz music, thinking of working with teachers in classrooms, thinking of the dance science interplay and thinking maybe back to my start, my first step into community engagement, thinking back to science in the parks, that communing and becoming, I think the science in the parks demonstrates that for me in, in a very practical kind of way, in a very like, I can feel what that should feel like in that space. So I thought I'd just leave you with what I, I get from all of this, my accidental stumbling into community engagement because I was just doing things that I thought would be interesting to me. I didn't think I wanna go be in a community engaged teacher. I thought there's kids in parks and I would love to do science with them. That would bring me joy. We could build relationships. But I, but I went through that back door and then realized what community engaged learning could be. It wasn't the other way around. And maybe that's, if you're like me, if you're that introvert turning into a skeptic, eventually turning into a curmudgeon like I have, maybe that's where you get your in on these other high impact educational experiences, is that you first see what is it that we really want out of education. And I'm, I know we teach from PowerPoint slides often, we say memorize these things, but probably that's not what it's all about, it's something deeper. And probably it's not just about what people can do independently, it's what people can do together. And probably when you as an instructor, when you as the professor are there with the class, it's not just about what it is you as a robot can provide, it's what you as a person can provide. And I think we should honor that person that we all are in those educational contexts. So to me, those are the, that's the trifecta, the who you are, how the relationships are built and what are the deeper ideas in learning. And I think here at Weber State, here within the College of Science, here in my context in the Department of Physics, I have been especially privileged, especially, uh, maybe privileged isn't the right word. I've gotten away with so much, like not wrongdoing, but just like, what is it you're doing or who's doing that? Oh, it's Adam. Okay, yeah, yeah, this, this, that's just what Adam does. He goes out and does stuff in parks and on dance stages. Um, and doing his work with teachers. And I, if I could give one recommendation to every other entity, every other vice president, dean, chair, et cetera, it's that we need to give opportunities not to say, go do this particular thing, but go do what it is that you do. Because um, that's what's benefited my career. And I would hope it's what's benefited the people that I've gotten to work with as well. So that's where I'll leave things. And I so appreciate, even though we are physically distanced, that you are all here. And I'm really grateful I've gotten the opportunity to give this quick little presentation. Thank you so much, Adam. Here, here. We do have about 12 minutes. So I encourage you all to ask questions. You can unmute. I think we're a small enough group that that would be fine. I'd love to hear from some of you. Um, 
I know that I was getting some messages, some some tearful uh, responses to your talk. So thank you so much, Adam. And if Brenda is still here, I apologize that I put down high impact educational experiences. I hope we can still be friends. <laughs> Adam, we can always be friends. Thanks, I Brenda. Didn't I didn't take offense at all. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's an interesting point, right? I mean, defines our reality sometimes, and that real, and those definitions can be limiting. Exactly. So, yeah, don't put us in boxes. And I love, I know you've always called yourself this accidental community engaged learner or community engaged educator. It's kind of been your story. It's been fun to watch that evolution. Um, we've been here. Yeah. The same number of decades. <laughs> um, so it's been really cool. I, and I so appreciated your comments today. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a question since no one else is unmuted. Um, I agree with you. The CEL, Community Engaged Learning, um, do you have an alternate term? No, and I and I I don't even argue with the term, like the term is fine, yeah. um, but I think um, maybe what we should think about is that a lot of faculty like me, or a lot of, you know, when I started here, I knew I wanted to do science with kids and with teachers, right? And so I wouldn't say, um, oh, I want to do community engaged learning. I had this. I wanted to do this one thing. So I think. I right. think our paths for someone like me might be just very different. And I eventually saw it was community engaged learning. Right. So I, as much as possible, I think we should give everyone the opportunity to do the things they are passionate about, that they are good at, that connect them with whomever. Right. And then a place like, uh, like, the, like the center then provides resources. Right. It's there to back these things up. It's, it's a struggle. I think that once something's labeled there's and there's that categorizing, as Brenda said, it, then there's, you know, you have to keep educating people. And if people don't see themselves as fitting into that box, then, right. yeah, I think that flexibility is huge. I really like the way you, you hit on that because I think for a lot of us, I happened in the community engaged learning accidentally as well. Um, and it's, it's probably for most of us, not something we set out to do, but then you realize, oh, this, this is the way to go. And it's like a light bulb moment. Yeah. Okay. And maybe that's how it is for everyone. And I just, I just thought, oh, well, Brenda Kovaleski, she was always, she came in here knowing exactly what she was going to do. Or right. Catherine McKinley always knew exactly. that she was the community engagement. Yeah. And maybe that's, maybe that's the lie I've told myself. Maybe we're all accidental in some way. They or maybe fooled us though. No, they were, they, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I um, totally have to second that comment, Becky Jo, because I was doing it before I knew what it was. I mean, I just, you know, you fall into it and it feels so right and it feels so good and it feels like, wow, this really is education. And yet you feel you got educated at the same time these other people are participating. And it's like, okay, I'm not going back. <laughs> I mean, I know I have to do this sort of thing, but this is pretty cool and pretty fulfilling. And, uh, you know, it, just, it grabs you and it doesn't let you go. <laughs> I was able to fool you guys because I started in grad school. That was where my accident happened. It happened in grad school. And then I started teaching that way in grad school. And I didn't know how to teach any other way. So by the time I took this job, forget it. I was already died in the wool. <laughs> that was it. And we weren't calling it community engaged learning. We were calling it service learning, right? With the hyphen. Right. Because the hyphen connected the service to the learning. Without the hyphen, it was just service, right? I mean, like, so, so the whole evolution of the language has been fascinating uh, in and of itself. There's a, there's a book there just in naming these kinds of activities. So. Adam, I have a question for you because we're in a book group. 
<laughs> that speaking of the language and how we label these things, that yeah, yeah, yeah that that book, this one right here. This is how far um, I've gotten. <laughs> so, um, the idea of best practice is brought up in this book that we're reading together, and it says something is better than something else. And I wonder if that is your aversion to high impact because it, it connotes that other things that aren't labeled as such don't possess that. Yeah, so, oh, and Becky Jo, this, the book is Preparing Science Teachers Through Practice-Based Teacher Education, uh -huh. which is an excellent read. So far, I can tell I'm 40 yeah. pages into Got it. Got me right there. Uh huh. Um, um, so yeah. So best practices, like if you really want to see my head explode, that's the one. Like to say this is the way you should do it, because in part it's like you say, like there's best, and then there's all the other junk that that I might have been doing before. Like that's offensive, but also to say like there is a single best practice, and that there's a best practice for all students and instructors that there is a best practice like like it's a, a computer algorithm like if you this then this like that's not what education is and so i think what we're reading in this particular uh practice-based book for preparing science teachers is that um it's something you have to as an instructor you have to continually problematize like um they talk about kind of improvisation prepared improvisation like what are you going to do in this particular case? Well, there isn't a best practice for that because that there's an infinite number of possibilities of what could happen. So what are the rehearsals you can go through? What are the, what's the kind of um, foundation you can lay for yourself in order to be ready for all kinds of possible things? But to equate it with, I know I'm speaking, I'm singing to the choir here to say, there is a best practice. And if you do this, then everyone will learn. If you do anything else, then they're not gonna learn as well. I think that's just nonsense. Um, so I'm, I'm, yes, you can tell I get agitated with that term. Thanks for that. Catherine, you have- <laughs> Thank you for having me up. <laughs> Did you wanna say, there you go. Are you talking to me? We have another Catherine, don't we? Oh, yes. I, I just want to say, I, you're all master teachers, and that's why you came about working with kids or working with your students in, in, any, in any discipline or area. You came about the, the way you knew was going to reach them best, but there are some people who really need help, and that's why we celebrate you, because you get to share, we get to hear how you came to this and what works for you and you're also different in your approaches to it. But I, but I think there are some processes. Am I? No, I'm not muted. Um, I think there are some processes that we all need to share with each other, like, like having our students reflect on what they're doing and, and, and then devise better ways or whatever. But um, I just, I really appreciate so much the the diversity of approaches based on your disciplines and your personalities and your opportunities and your students and yay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for reiterating that, that it's about all of those different conditions and all the different players that are in that any given context at a, at a given time. Um, so yes, we must have expertise and then it's so much more than that. It's building that, building what learning you can from that expertise and from all the relationships you've got within. So Adam, um, thank you so much. That was just inspirational. Um, I, I wanted to, um, if you went to Ibram Kendi's a talk a month, month and a half ago, one of the things he said was um, somebody asked him about how you bring diversity, equity, and inclusion into what it is that you do. And he said, you know, follow your passion and opportunities will appear for you to 
you know, to bring those into into what you're doing. And I think that's kind of what you've just been saying is that you follow your passion and opportunities are there for not only for you to be becoming, but but people you are working with. Yeah. So anyway, that's I'm grateful. That's I I'm true to have that reminder from Ibram Max Kendi. And I that reminded me of a couple years before that we had um, Cornell West on campus, and I was floored by his distinction of well, floored by so much that he brought. Um, but he reminded us that there's there's things we do for pleasure and there's things we do for joy, and to reemphasize that that thing that is joy is kind of at the essence of you that you can continue to um, uh, that it isn't just spur of the moment that isn't going to be temporary that is who you are down to your, your spirit. And those are the things that will keep you going. Those are the things that you can rely on as being valuable, not just to you, but as your contribution to others. So um, I think we should do more of that, suggesting that teachers find joy in what they're doing um, because, because I know they do and we don't acknowledge it enough. And second of all, because I think that's where some of our greatest um, teaching and learning, um, that's when it happens, is when we allow that joy to be cultivated. Yeah, well said. And, you know, give teachers tenure who deserve it. Any final questions for Adam? We are at three o'clock, so I want to Um, again, we Adam, does anyone have an alternate picture of you in the grass with that child? Like, I want someone else to have taken the picture of you with the mi like the microscope as well. You know, so so I I took that picture. Like, I thought, oh, this is a moment, and I never want to forget this. And I took a picture of him so that I could remember what it felt like to be me. So yeah, I have the picture here, but you'll just have to imagine what that is. Reminds me of the little prince. <laughs> We're lucky to have you, Adam. We're lucky to have your example. And Thank the you. fact that you're willing to share um, your accidents with us. Um, truly, greatly appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks so much.